Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? You doing okay? Awesome. Hey, Kate, good to see you this morning, girl. I got a thumbs up back here. That's great. Well, look, it's good to see you. If you're a guest, my name is Josh. We are so glad that you're a part of our time this morning. Again, whether it's your first time here or online, want to do a big shout out to the family and group that is meeting for church right now in Athens, Georgia. So glad that you're a part of our time. Same with those who are in Indiana and elsewhere across the great United States. Welcome. We're glad that you're here today. Well, today we are in part two of a teaching series called the Holy Spirit, where we are simply looking at who He is. So I'm going to ask you, grab your Bibles right quick and turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. It's a real easy place to find. Open your Bibles, go past table of content, and you're there. So real simple, real easy to find. While you're doing that, today is a very special day because this is Memorial Day weekend. Established in 1868, it was the day to commemorate those who sacrificed, who uh, gave their lives for this nation. And so every year we have the privilege of being able to thank God for the men and women who have uh, bled and died for us so that we may live. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what it is we come to celebrate every Sunday when we as Christ followers remember what Christ did? So here's what I'd like to do this morning, and we do this every year, but I'd like just to invite, if you are currently or have ever been a part of or served in one of our branches of military, uh, would you just stand up for us? We'd like to recognize you this morning. If you are active or former, would you just, yeah, would you just celebrate? Thank you. You may be seated. Now, now, I know, I know, I know. Sometimes when we do this on Memorial Day, there are those of you who want to remind me, well, wait a minute, Josh. Uh, Memorial Day is to memorialize or to remember those who died, not those who lived. We celebrate the living at Veterans Day, which is November the 11th. But let me just suggest to you that we as a church find excuses to show honor, not reasons not to show honor. Does that make sense? Um, And this is true. And by the way, one of the things I love about you all is you will express agreement or disagreement like, I don't agree. That's okay, but uh, talk to me. But let me just tell you, the reason this is so important is because as Christians, we have the privilege of giving honor to whom honor is due. And ultimately, honor goes to Jesus Christ. Jesus, however, has given us Friends and family and people that have been blessings. And so we want to celebrate and honor. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. Where we're going this morning is all about recognizing what we've been given. In fact, I'm going to say something to you that even though I don't know you personally, maybe, I know this is absolutely true about you. This is not just true of you. This is true of your children. This is true of your neighbors. This is true of the people you go to work with. This is even true of that person who gets stuck on Highway 58 with you and you get angry at because they cut you off just to be two cars in front of you. You know the person I'm talking about? So what is it? Here's what I know. It's been my experience that our thankfulness and our willingness to give honor is in proportion to how much we realize we have been given. If you know you've been given a lot, aren't you more thankful, church? Now, if you think you've only been given this much, your gratitude will match. But if you know what you've been given, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, your thankfulness, your honoring will grow as well. I was thinking about it this week. You know, Lindsay and I, my wife and I, we will periodically evaluate and look at our savings because we're, we've got goals like so many of you. We've got car saving goals. We've got, you know, um, you know, vacation goals. We have, here's the big one, we have college saving goals for the kids. You know that one? Now, here's the thing, here's the thing. Growing up, my mom and daddy helped us with college, and I appreciated it this much because that's how much I thought college cost. How many of us as parents know what college really costs? And now as parents, we go, oh my goodness, what my mom and daddy did. Oh my gracious. My gratitude has grown as I've understood the gift given. 
we're about to talk about the ultimate gift you've been given. And your appreciation and thankfulness will be in proportion to how much you understand what you've been given. This was the story of those first people who heard that the promised gift of the Holy Spirit was now available. In Acts chapter 2, there's this little group of believers, about 120. By the way, that's less than half of the number of people in this room, about a third or a fourth of the number of people in here. That is the entire church. And they're gathered together, and God's Spirit comes on them as Jesus promised the Spirit would. And the Spirit comes as a mighty wind, empowering them. And the people outside in the city of Jerusalem hear this great commotion and say, what's going on? And at that moment, Peter comes out and says, I've got great news for you. And so through the book of Acts, the story of the church, the first 35 years roughly of the church's history, every time someone gets the Holy Spirit, people go bananas because they're like, I can't believe the Spirit is not just for me, it's for you as well. And not just for you, but for you and for you. I want you to know the gift that you've been given today. Because the people who first heard that the gift of the Spirit was available had heard the rumors. They'd heard the stories, but they had not personally experienced it. And so I want to take us through the story of the Spirit's presence in the Old Testament so that maybe you and I will regain the wonder and the awe of the gift of the Spirit and give thanks to God just a little bit more because we know what He's given us. And so the story begins, as all great stories do, with this wonderful phrase, in the beginning or once upon a time. But it's not fictional. It is a real moment sometime in ancient times past. God created the heavens and the earth. And that phrase, heaven and earth, is a Hebrew way of saying God made everything. All that we know, all that we don't know, He made it. Now, you say, how does this show us the Holy Spirit's presence? Well, that little word, God, is the Hebrew word Elohim. Everybody say Elohim. Congratulations, Hebrew scholars. That word Elohim is the plural of the Hebrew word El, which is God the plural of God. So in the very first line of the Bible, we are introduced to the triune God, the three-in-one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit enters the stage. Wow! What a way to begin the story. But no time has passed before we're then introduced to a problem. You see, we're told that the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And again, this phrase, formless and empty, is a Hebrew way of saying that all that there was was simply chaos. It was darkness. Things were out of order. Life was churning like the seas on a t- when a storm was passing by. Quick question, family, before we go any further. How many of us would say that the world out there is marked by chaos? How many of us turn on the news, pull it up on our web browser, and maybe it's not even out there? How many of us, I mean, if we're just real honest, would say the storm isn't out there, the chaos isn't out there, the chaos isn't here? Man, I, mean, I look good. I came to church, and I, I got dressed up for this. Like, I painted my mug. There's paint on the barn. I'm looking good. Or, or maybe you're like me. You took a shower this morning. You put on matching socks. You are going all out because you're at church, and you look good. But it's just covering up the chaos that's going on in your marriage or with your children or at your work. And it may not even be that things are bad. It's just, maybe it's this. Maybe it's that even in your work, for instance, you like your job, but you keep hitting like a ceiling of joy. You feel like there should be something more in it, and you never get the satisfaction that you think is supposed to be there. There's chaos, isn't there? And so the Scriptures tell us, that God enters the scene, and there's this beautiful statement that the Spirit of God was hovering over these dark and tumultuous waters. I love this word hovering. This word hovering is rahaf. It's this Hebrew word that is used one more time, and the next time it's used is in Deuteronomy 32, 11, and it describes an eagle with its wings unfurled, protecting and caring for its young. 
The Spirit of God enters the chaotic spaces. Friend, if your life is upside down right now, if there's something going on, darkness and roiling waters, the Spirit of God wants to enter that place and put His arms over you. Hear me now. The Spirit of God is not pushing you away when things are chaotic. He says that's where He does His best work. Is that good news this morning? And so He comes and He covers us So the first thing, if you're writing anything down, I'm going to give you three things. Here's number one. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God controls and orders the chaos. If you have chaos in your life, the good news is the Spirit of God that entered the darkness, who created order from the chaos, is the same God who wants to enter your space and bring order to your life. Now, interesting little word here, Spirit. It comes from a Hebrew word, Ruach. Ruach. It sounds like something stuck in your throat. You know. <clears throat> so, so let's practice together. Now that I've cleared my throat, it's your turn. So it's Ruach. On the count of three, I want you to say it with me. If you need to cover your mouth for the person's head behind you, that's fine. Do that, okay? But one, two, three, we're going to say Ruach. Ready? One, two, three. Ruach. Don't you just feel better? <clears throat> the, the Greek word equivalent is pneuma. So have you ever heard of pneumonia? breath. In fact, that's really what this word means. This one word can be translated in multiple ways. The word ruach can be translated spirit or wind. Let's put this up here. Or breath or a blast of breath, a violent exaltation. It's this idea that the presence of God, yes, He is spirit, but He is this wind. He is this breath breathing life into death. He is coming fast. No one can control or predict where He comes from or where He is going, but He is always on the move. He is always at work. In fact, the next moment we see He brings life into a lifeless form. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God creates man out of dust and dirt. By the way, ladies, that's why our natural state as men is to be dusty and dirty. We're just acting the way God made us, okay? And so He creates man out of dust and dirt, but He's not fully alive until He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life. And the man, notice this word, he became a living being. You see, you can be alive and not live. The presence of God comes and fills every space and every place of our lives. That's the second thing I want you to notice here this morning is in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit empowered ordinary people to live extraordinary lives. He controls and orders chaos, and then he says, it's not enough to put the house in order. I have a purpose for your life and will empower you to fulfill your purpose. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see the Spirit of God coming on people. We see the Spirit of God come to Joseph and give him skill to rule over Egypt in Genesis 41. The Spirit of God gives Joshua military power. He gives men skill to work as craftsmen building the tabernacle. He gives words to the prophets. He gives Gideon power to lead this group, whatever that is. He gives Samson, Samson, the mighty man of testosterone, the ability to tear apart a lion in Judges 14, 6. And Saul, the very first king of Israel, he says, I will come on you and you will prophesy and you will become a changed man. How many of us would love to be changed today? Are there things that you wish were different, family? I know there are in my life and the beauty of the Spirit of God through the Old Testament, the stories that those first followers heard were of these moments where the presence of God came and He empowered ordinary people, just like you, just like me, to do extraordinary things. Because He doesn't simply order, He empowers. But see, there's a problem here, and and this is the problem that those in Acts 2 got, and I don't know that we get it. So, So come with me in this moment. Consider this thought with me for a second. There is a problem because the Spirit of God comes on people, but He does not always stay, does He? In fact, when we read about this man named Saul, God comes and He empowers Saul. He gives him an ability to do what he could not do. He prophesies, becomes a changed man, but Saul over time begins to stiff arm God. He does a spiritual Heisman. And God finally, being the quintessential gentleman, says, I'm not going to push myself on you. And God removes his presence from Saul. By the way, just just a quick moment, church. 
if the natural order of things is chaos without God, then the worst curse you could experience in all of Scripture was God removing His hand from you. The worst thing is not that God would punish us for sin, because that means He's near to us like a father who disciplines his child, but is a God who would not discipline but say, I give you over, I'm walking away, because then life crashes back in, the waters come roiling and dark, and chaos resumes. This is why David, the greatest king of Israel, this man who had committed a sin with Bathsheba, killed a man, and yet he, he comes before God after his great sin. Notice what he says. The Spirit of the Lord departed Saul in 1 Samuel 16. He leaves Saul. But then he comes on David. Let's go next slide here. And David cries out, do not cast me from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. The Spirit of God comes on people. But he did not always come on people and stay on people. The Holy Spirit of God came on some people for some time, but not on all people for all time. That's the third thing I want you to jot down. The Holy Spirit would come, but not on all people for all time. But here's the reality. You and I need to be empowered, don't we? Anyone else here feel like you just have life figured out perfectly? Anyone here go, yes, I am God's gift to my spouse and my children. I am perfect in all my ways. Anyone in here willing to make that claim? Anyone in here want to correct their spouse who may want to make that claim? See, here's the reality. The Spirit of God comes on us like this mighty wind. And I love that picture of a wind because um, how, how many of you have ever been on a sailboat? Anyone ever go out on a sailboat? You go out there, beautiful day like yesterday. What do you need for a sailboat to work? You need wind. See, a beautiful day on the lake becomes a really bad day on the lake if you're in a sailboat with no wind. You need the Spirit filling the sails of your life. You cannot do it on your own. And if God removes His presence, you are stuck where you are. There is no movement. There is, not go- there is no going anywhere. And in the Old Testament, the people knew. The people knew that God showed up in some places, sometimes with some people, but not all people. And they said, oh, for the day that God would come on me. That I wouldn't simply read about God's work in someone else's life, but I would experience it in my own life. I want to ask you this morning, how many of us are tired about reading the stories and are ready to live the story of God's work? Is anyone else hungry to experience God's presence in their life, to not simply be an observer of things that have happened, but to witness them today? It's like the guy who is in his 40s, and he's still wearing his high school football letterman jacket talking about the glory days. Any of you guys know that guy? If you are that guy, just don't bring your letterman jacket to church, okay? We'll tease you about it. But how many of us hear the stories and we constantly talk about the glory days when God's desire is that His glory would be seen in our day. And so this moment comes after centuries of only hearing stories that God speaks through a prophet named Joel and He makes this beautiful promise. He says this afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on, say these two words real loud with me, are you ready? On all people. Not just some, not just the Davids in the Bible, not not just the the ones who did everything right or seemed to be the special people. He's not saying, oh, just, just on some. He says, there's coming a day when God's presence will be poured out on all people. And as Jesus said last week, as we read in John 14, he will come not for a time, but forever and be on you. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. Those days. This phrase, those days. What days are those days? These are the days in Acts chapter 2. When the Spirit of God came to that group of 120 people like a rushing ruach. The wind of God blew empowering. And the people of the city said, I want what you got. Is there any way? And they begin to hear the story. Peter, empowered by the Spirit of God, begins to preach a message. 
And he tells them the story of God. And within this story, he tells them how they personally had been party to the death of God, the crucifixion of Jesus. And they're broken hearted. But he says, don't worry, something's about to happen. And he quotes this moment from, my, from Joel where he says, in those last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Peter, in this moment, is looking at a crowd of people who are hungry for more. And he says, you've been waiting. You have been longing for this moment. And I'm here to tell you the day is today. The gift is ready for you. They say, well, what must we do to be saved? We've broken the heart of God. We have disobeyed. And Peter says it is as simple as repentance. Repentance means turning around, stop going the way you went, and be baptized, immersed into the waters. There's nothing magical about the water, but you need to be immersed in Jesus, covered head to toe, fully covered by what He can do and only He does. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And notice this, notice this, he says, and you will receive the gift. The gift of the God who showed up in Genesis. The gift of the God who showed up to Joseph when he needed him in Egypt. The gift of the God of Joshua who needed help leading. The gift of God who spoke words through the prophets so they could share with others the hope and the truth of God. The presence of the living God who came on a man so terrified of his oppressors that he was hiding, named Gideon. The power of God who came on an ordinary man and gave him extraordinary strength. The power of God who changed a man named Saul. The power of God, he says, This gift is now yours, the power, the presence, the might of Almighty God. And He will not simply come alongside you, but He will now live inside you. Is that good news for anyone this morning? This is the gift He promised. And it's not just for some people. Notice this, this promise. By the way, what's a promise? It means whatever you say you'll do, you'll do. This promise is for you, the people listening. And it's for your kiddos, not just for your generation, but the next generation. He says, and, and, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Here we are 2,000 years later on the other side of the world, not speaking Hebrew, Greek, or anything else. We Gentiles have been given the gift of God's promise. Do you understand why this is incredible? That the universe creating God is here today. And He is in you. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, if you've given your life to God, He says, I will give my life for you and I will live in you and I will be in you, empowering you to do what you cannot do on your own. This is the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. God says He will pour out His gift on all of us. So my one question, my one question. Are you ready? Here's the question. I'm going to give you a question. Are you ready for the question? Okay, you're not ready for the question, are you? I'm I'm going to ask you a question, but if you're not ready, we're just going to pause until you're ready. Are you ready for the question, church? No, you're not. You just want to get home or get to the restaurant before the Baptists do. I know, I know, okay. But I'm going to give you the question anyway. Here's the question. Are you ready? Here's the question. If God has given you this gift, if it is available to all who will call on the name of the Lord, who will receive Christ, here's my question. Have you received the gift? Have you received the Genesis 1 spirit who doesn't push you away when all is wrong but comes to make all right? Have you received the empowering presence of God who will do in you things you cannot do on your own? Have you received the gift that isn't just for some, but it has been made available to all? And maybe the next question is this. If you've received him, is he working in you? 
You say, well, Josh, I, I think I've got them, but, but how, do I, how do I know? Here's how you know. Here's how you know. Are you ready? Whatever he says to do, you do it. Whatever you hear him say, whatever impression. Remember last week we said, how do I know it's the Spirit? Well, the Spirit leads us towards what he wants and away from what I want. I'm a selfish person. I want what I want in my marriage. I want what I want with my kids. I want what I want in my church, in my job, in my school, or my city. I'm selfish. So when you hear him calling you to do something different than what you want, are you saying, yes, yes? Because as he comes, as he makes himself available, as you say yes to the Spirit, just you watch out. The same God who created order from chaos is ready to do it again in your life and then empower you to do what you can't do on your own. Do you have the Spirit of God? Before we ever see a movement in this church, we will have to welcome the Spirit into our lives. Have you done that? And if not, why not? See, today could be the day. We celebrate memorials all the time, don't we? We celebrate birthdays. That's a memorial to someone's birth. We celebrate anniversaries of weddings, of funerals of special dates. We have memorials all the time. I want you to know the memorial that I celebrate more than any other is September 24th, 1989. That was the day that I was born again, and the Spirit of God came in me. And I want you to know He wants to come in you as well. And if He's in you, He wants to have full reign in the house of your life. Will you say yes to Him this morning?